Good morning, everyone. I'm Domini Wright from the Department of Agriculture and Food, and today we're discussing powdery mildew and giving you an update on powdery mildew in wheat with Kira Beard from our Geraldton office. Good morning, Kira. Um, so I'm hoping you can tell us why we're going to be um, discussing powdery mildew um, at this early stage in the season and give us some information about it. Thank you, Dominic. Now, the reason we're revisiting powdery mildew in wheat is because of recent reports in pest facts um, from powdery mildew found in the white tillering Kalingri wheat crop in the Bindi Bindi region and also a late tillering Trojan wheat crop south of Kudu. So um, it's just a reminder that it's really helpful to report any fines to pest facts for the benefit of um, industry so we know what we're up against. The key messages we're going to be looking at today are considering the conditions last year that favoured um, powdery mildew and what we need to look out for this year. So powdery mildew carried o is carried over on stubble and so there's widespread inoculum um, expected to be on stubble, on wheat stubble this year after the disease being widespread in 2015. The disease wheat powdery mildew is uh, distinctly different from barley powdery mildew so they don't infect each other or vice versa. Um, Early sowing or the presence of green bridge allows early season start-up of epidemic. So early sown crops are the ones to focus on first and um, areas particularly down south where there was plenty of rain early on um, and green bridge developed are also at high risk. Now while not registered, um, in furrow or seed dressing products will have an effect on the time of onset of disease. So a lot of infarro has gone out. Um, and although currently no seed dressings or infarro are registered for powdery mildew in wheat, there are several such as flutriophol, infarro and fluconazole seed dressings which are registered for powdery mildew in barley and do a very good job. So the monitoring priorities this year are susceptible varieties. Now. Um, varieties range in susceptibility from very susceptible to resistant. Variety trials in 2015 showed that varieties of moderately susceptible or um, more susceptible um, resistance provide significant reduction in disease severity. So if using moderately susceptible or worse varieties and prepare a disease management strategy relevant to the resistance um, ranking of that variety. So early sown crops, as I mentioned earlier, um, last year particularly we saw they became more um, severely infected um, because they're exposed to the disease for longer. Those without infarro or seed dressing fungicide, those in green bridge areas um, as well are the ones that are more likely to be at higher risk. So just reminding you what um, the disease looks like. The disease was widespread in the northern and central wheat belt and in the Esperance region in 2015, particularly in the wild, widely grown susceptible varieties such as wild catchem and korak. Um, as I said before, it survives on stubble and on volunteer wheat. And last year we had um, an autumn green bridge in a lot of areas after summer storms and good autumn rainfall. So there was early inoculum in some areas followed by a humid and moist growing season and um, that favoured the persistence and spread of the disease. So the disease is spread um, in temperatures of 15 to 22 degrees so it likes mild temperatures and high humidity in excess of 70 percent. Under these conditions it can have a short infection cycle of um, as little as seven days um, and the secondary spread occurs by wind. So it usually starts out low in the canopy and then it moves upwards and the flag leaf can become infected and then it rapidly leads to head infection. So the disease is um, a higher risk in areas that are dense, like dense crop canopies or where air, air circulation is poor in damp shaded areas or um, places a high seeding rate or high nitrogen nutrition. 
and areas with a good soil mo moisture profile which promotes canopy humidity. So um, last year we saw that um, even in crops with thinner canopies they were exposed to a high inoculum pressure because um, there was a lot of disease around so they um, even developed infection whereas usually it would be mostly on the denser crops. So the key messages um, we're going to be covering today are about fungicide application. Fun foliar fungicide sprays should be applied at a registered rate on a susceptible variety and they can significantly reduce disease and potentially increase yield. Yield response though is not guaranteed and we saw this last year um, in two out of the six trials that we had, um, two of them did not give a yield response. Um, so it really depends on the severity of the disease that sprang and whether there are favourable weather conditions after application as to whether um, you'll get a profitable response from a fungicide application. Timely application is more important than product choice. If you use any of the products that are registered, you should get a good response. Um, fungicides are more effective as, or more efficient as protectants and eradicants. So to get the most value from fungicides and achieve optimal yield benefit, it's crucial to control the disease before it becomes too severe and before it develops in upper canopy and on heads. Last year, we found the value of applying a second fungicide spray was not justified by a significant yield response. And this is probably because the hot dry finish in 2015 um, meant the disease um, naturally just disappeared on its own. Whereas this year could be different um, and it will obviously depend on when the first fungicide spray goes on um, because a second spray may be warranted if um, three to four weeks after the first spray if active infections are visible. So that um, white fluffy growth is visible on the leaves and um, that means it's new as opposed to the old ones which are grey and have little black specks in them. So if new infections are visible um, then and moving up the canopy it's showing that the fungicide's running out and a second spray may be required but this will depend on the seasonal conditions following this um, intended spray date and whether there's much of the season left and you definitely wouldn't want to apply fungicide after flowering. Finally we're going to talk about, um, at the end of the talk we're going to address foliar fungicide um, resistant strategies to avoid fungicide resistance developing in wheat. So basically in 2015 we had six trials and one demo and most of the fungicide products tested provided significant disease control and gave a significant yield increase compared to the untreated. So the um, average yield response across all the trials was 8%. So this is a reminder that though the disease can look really severe. Um, it's not like the rusts that can really decimate a crop. So it's important to keep that in mind when you're considering profitability and particularly whether it's worth putting on a second spray. So um, here are the yield responses um, by trial as we saw in 2015. So these are the locations of the trials, Gibson, Mungleup, West Buntine, Munyanooka, two in Geraldton, one early zone and one late zone and one at Sandy Gully, which is up near Northampton. So the yield response to one application, you can see here this is the range because there were several fungicides at um, each site. So the range was from non-significant, these ones here. Um, the weather just got really quite warm and dry, so they didn't have any significant um, yield response. And this earlier zone one, for example, was an example of if you sow it early and there isn't much left of the season when you put the fungicide on, then you're less likely to get a yield response and also the disease was really quite severe when that fungicide was put on. So that one um, was applied too late to be worthwhile. The yield response to two applications, in some sites there were two applications and you can see that they really weren't very different to one application, which is what I said before, except for the um, later zone Geraldton. Um, trial which was um, really very high disease severity. 
Then at the bottom row we have the untreated versus the average single spray, so that's where when we average all that we get an average of 8%. Um, it's the average across all the trials. So moving on um, to look at the one trial in particular, this was the trial that Michael McPherson had with the Levy group, um, Michael McPherson from Imtrade. So he looked at the fungicide disease levels on the um, flag minus one when the fungicide was applied at Z41. So that's um, flag leaf fully unfurled. So you can see that the disease severity is on the um, y-axis and you can see that the untreated significantly um, just blew out with lots of disease um, after 42 days, whereas all the fungicide treated um, plots had significant disease control and they really um, were not much different to each other in the scheme of things. So the data also clearly showed that you can get at least four weeks efficacy of fungicides, um, but of course this will also depend on situation, but um, in this in this situation they got four weeks. So timely application is more important than fungicide choice, so that was one of the key messages we found last year, so as long as it's registered then um, it should give a good response. It's important to um, remind you that leaves or heads that are not emerged at the time of fungicide application won't be protected from disease, which seems quite logical. But um, last year, for example, there was a lot of new tillers that came out with um, the rain and so they came out after fungicide application and they were enough to keep the disease going. And so um, a lot of people were concerned that the fungicide wasn't behaving as they expected and they thought maybe there was some problem with fungicide resistance developing but it was really just the nature of um, that unprotected leaves causing ongoing disease. So limiting powdery mildew in the canopy um, is very important because it reduces disease on the leaves and the heads that emerge later. So the managing the disease is challenging um, if it gets really severe. So apply the fungicide when the disease is present. So we would say about 5%, but you know, basically just if you can see the disease there and that they're fresh, white, fluffy pustules um, and they're moving up the canopy. So as the disease progresses, it turns grey and the, um, you know, the spores go grey and then they get black speckles in them and that you can tell that that's drying out or ageing and so um, that means it's on the way out but if you can see new white um, pustules then you know that it's fresh and it's new and if the outlooks for continuing moist humid conditions then it's um, important to consider applying fungicide before it gets more severe. Now you can um, consider different rates obviously depending on what time of the season you're applying the fungicide. But if you use a rate um, at a high level, um, you may not need to apply a second spray. So, so to finish up with, um, I just wanted to talk about fungicide resistance in wheat. Now we all know about fungicide resistance in barley, um, which is already a problem in WA, but what about fungicide resistance in wheat powdery mildew? So last year there were people um, saying that they didn't think the fungicides were working very well and it was more likely related to high inoculum pressure and just the amazing conditions we had that were very suitable for infection. To address the concerns of industry, um, Madeline Tucker from the Centre for Crop and Disease Management at Curtin, she um, tested samples that people sent in, so thank you to people who sent in samples of um, wheat with powdery mildew on it, because she was able to test 71 leaf samples, um, 53 were from WA, 6 from New South Wales, 10 from South Australia and 2 from Tasmania. Um, thankfully she found the WA samples all um, looked fine, no mutation, no fungicide resistance. Unfortunately the New South Wales and Tasmania samples are showing a 136 gateway mutation, which means that they could potentially develop um, resistance to fungicide. Um, they're on the, on the way to doing that. So that is a really big concern and a reminder to all of us that we need to follow fungicide application guidelines to avoid the risk of fungicide resistance developing. 
So that just involves, where possible, using mixtures that contain different modes of action, um, spraying fungicides at the first site um, if weather conditions are conducive, uh, using recommended fungicide label rates, rotating the active ingredients, avoiding using the same fungicide um, more than twice in a season, and um, keeping crops healthy but avoiding over-application of nitrogen as that can lead to a higher powdery and mildew risk. Oh, I should say before I move on to this one, if you suspect fungicide resistance is occurring, um, then you're very welcome to send samples in to Curtin because they would love to get more samples this year. And um, because the powdery mildew fungus is a bit sensitive, it likes to travel in a special postal tube so that it makes it um, safely to Perth. So if you can contact the um, fungicide resistance group at Curtin, they'll send you out a free um, sample pack so that you can send it safely in, um, and that would be very valuable for all of industry, really. So I'd just like to acknowledge that the data presented today was from the trials that we adapted last year, and um, some of them were from Landmark, the Levy Group, Northampton Agri Services, and DAFWA and GRDC for funding the trials. So now, thank you very much for listening.